<laughs> I have resumed the recording for this seminar and I'm going to start the introduction. Um, so I will have to mute everybody. Yes. Uh, and I will also ask everybody to please um, turn off their cameras during the seminar, except for Graham, of course, uh, and then turn them on again at the end of the discussion. Um, so I will start by um, acknowledging that we are on um, the traditional land of uh, the Noongar people. And I'd like to start by paying my respect to um, the traditional owners of the Wajak Bujar um, and pay my respect to um, their elders. Um, and we are now going to start this seminar, if the computer is okay to listen to me. Yep. So we are now halfway through our seminar series for archaeology at UWA. Uh, it is usually at 3 p.m. WA time on Fridays, but you've noticed that this one was at a different time um, to try to accommodate our international guests on the other side of the planet, although he still had to wake up really early <laughs> this morning uh, because of you know, different time changes. Um, but everybody's here now, that's all good. Uh, we still have six more seminars for everybody interested. Um, and just quickly, next week, we're going to have uh, Candace Richards from the University of Sydney talking to us about new scientific uh, methods applied to the archaeological collections in the Chow Chak Wing Museum and how these impacted uh, the way that the exhibitions are being prepared now. Um, you can know all of these uh, events and seminars by following us on our you know, numerous social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and the Eventbrite page for all of these seminars, so please do so. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody specifically um, online. Um, beware that you're all recorded. Everything that you will say, do, and every message that you send is recorded, but also actually shown on a really big screen in the room where we are. So even if you think that you're sending me a private message, it's, it's there, okay, on the big wall. So just be careful. Um, and now I can finally introduce our guest speaker today. We're very happy uh, that uh, Professor Graham Warren uh, from University College of Dublin uh, has accepted to um, give us a talk today. Um, so he's a professor of archaeology uh, there and specializing on hunter-gatherer archaeology, um, specifically European Mesolithic. And today is actually going to question this um, appellation. Um, you know, is there actually such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology? So obviously we're all really interested um, to hear about that. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. And I'm going to um, have you share your PowerPoint now, if that's fine. So. Uh, that. Where is it? Stop share. Yes, I know it should be good for you. Okay, just one moment. Hopefully, then you're all seeing that that title yes. screen. Now. Yeah. Fantastic, and you can hear me properly. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um. Thank you very much indeed, um, Emily, for the um, introduction and for all of the organizational work on this. And um, I shall hold my hands up and well, first of all, to, to thank all of you for accommodating me with a, a slight change of time to your schedules. It's, it's nine o'clock in the morning here, not quite as bad as it's seven o'clock in the morning. I thought it was going to be, but I've just had a bit of a disaster with time zones. But I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, to, pleased to be here anyway. And I'd also like to thank um, Martin Poor for um, initially um, inviting me to speak to your to your seminar series, which look, which looks fascinating. So, by by way of background here, this is a, a paper which I initially presented in January of this year to the International Society for for Hunter Gatherer Research, and I'm grateful to the participants in that seminar for for discussion. And it was recently submitted to a special issue of the journal Heritage, a special issue focusing on um, cultural heritage amongst hunter-gatherers. And I'm delighted that that was accepted, subject to, to minor revisions, and that the editors have allowed me to use feedback from this seminar as part of the minor revision process. So you can, you can think of all of yourself as part of the refereeing process of this paper, and I'll have a chance, hopefully, to incorporate your feedback into the revisions of that paper. Um, in, in a tweet promoting this, Martin suggested that this paper was a, was a provocative paper, a provocative title. Um, 
I don't know whether that's the case or not. It's certainly, for me, it's been a very personal question, a personal question that I've needed to, to try and work through, a question which has become very important for me. And, and I'm pleased that the response I've had to this so far suggests that that, that process of reflection has, has been of use to others. And I think before developing that, that argument at all, I think it's important to, to stress the, the positionality of, of my work and the, the framing of this question, which is I'm, a, I'm European, I'm English by background, although I, I live in Ireland, I've lived in Ireland for nearly 20 years, and I'm a citizen of Ireland, and I'm a, a specialist in Northwest European archaeology of hunter-gatherers, the, the Mesolithic period. And I realize and, and recognize that my answer to this question, is there such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology, it is very much a, a European question. And that's why I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to present this to an Australian audience. And I'm really, really looking forward to your, your feedback and suggestions um, about how I developed this, this argument and some of the, some of the ideas that are, that are associated with it. So I, I hope to speak for, for no more than 40 minutes to leave plenty of opportunity for that discussion at the end. I start with, a, with an image I drew at the age of about seven or eight years old in 1980 or 1981 as part of um, some work I was doing at what was junior school um, at the time. I'm very grateful to my mum and dad for preserving this image. It, it wasn't always clear that my path would lead me to, to hunter-gatherer archaeology, so this is, this is rather prescient. And, and, and I, I show the image here to, to highlight the way in which the, the popular idea of hunter-gatherers is produced in different ways, almost if you like the, the co-production of these powerful ideas of what hunter-gatherers might be. So it, clearly there are people in the world, both today and in the past, who live lifestyles that we might describe as, as hunter-gatherers. We have a variety of what, what micro-scientific evidence about those ways of life. But that evidence is also then caught up in a whole suite of processes of knowledge production. And the, the, the relationship between what we call hunter-gatherers and those lives that people, people lead is not completely straightforward. And one of the key processes here is, is education, the way in which these ideas are embedded in educational practices. And clearly that's what was going on here. We were being taught about human evolution, hunter-gatherers, the adoption of farming, I'll show another picture um, a little bit later on. And here, ideas about what makes people different. Ice Age man has well-developed brains and has tools. These are some of these distinctive characteristics. But this is really just to highlight that even at a young age, in a Western European context, Southern Europe, Southern English school, these ideas about what hunter-gatherers were are being reinforced through particular forms of pedagogical discourse. And I've increasingly realized that this is more or less what I've been doing for the last 20 years. I teach hunter-gatherers, I teach hunter-gatherer archaeology at UCD, and I have done for, for 20 years. And actually, probably in recent years, I, I've used that phrase more and more. I started describing myself perhaps not so much as a, as a Mesolithic specialist, but as someone who worked on the archaeology of hunter-gatherers with a, a particular focus in the prehistory of Northwest Europe. I became quite involved in the International Society for Hunter-Gatherer Research. I serve on their board and I'm hosting the next of their CHAGs, the Conference on Hunting and Gathering Societies meeting. The next one of those is in Dublin next year and I'll say something about that towards the end. But, but within ISHKA, I was uh, advocating for more, sorry, I was, within ISHKA, I was advocating for, for more hunter-gatherer involvement, for the role that hunter-gatherer archaeology should play within the broader hunter-gatherer research community. And just last year, I managed to, to get passed through UCD a brand new master's course on hunter-gatherer archaeology, which starts in September 2021. So in all of these things that I'm doing, I was reiterating the idea that there is such a thing as hunter-gatherer archaeology. And one might have suspected that because I was doing all of these things that suggested there was a thing called hunter-gatherer archaeology, I actually knew what that meant. But over the last 18 months, I became increasingly less certain that I did understand what I meant by that phrase. And a, and a series of, of overlapping questions became really important to me. Is there actually such a thing as a distinctive hunter-gatherer archaeology? Is it different than other kinds of archaeology? And if it is different, how might it be different? Is it the same in different places throughout the world? And if there is such a thing, and knowing how problematic the term hunter-gatherer is, and we'll come back to this, how can we justify been continuing to use this term. And, and this paper is really an, an attempt to unpick that, that 
that doubt that was growing in me about this repeated use of this term. So what is hunter-gatherer archaeology and is it, is it different? If we turn to some of the, the kind of standard review papers, there's a, a reasonably straightforward statement that hunter-gatherer archaeology is different. So an apprentice, for example, argues that achieving a comprehensive knowledge of past hunter-gatherers requires knowledge beyond the standard training received by other archaeologists. And that's good. We can, we can feel good about that. We have something more challenging. Um, Vivian Scheinshone, in another um, summary overall, again says hunter-gatherer archaeology is different. It's actually very basic and very straightforward. And I think what she's, what she's arguing about here is really about the character of the materials that we deal with, the character of the distinctive, possibly distinctive material for hunter-gatherer archaeology. But both of these papers are, are very short papers. They're in um, encyclopedias of archaeology or the social sciences, and they don't really have a chance to, to pick at what this difference might be and to, to build, a, to, to my mind, an in-depth or compelling argument. And it's this that I want to try and tease out a little bit today. So I'm going to approach this through four what we might call prisms, although don't take that metaphor too seriously. It's four questions, four vantages, if you like. The first suggests that hunter-gatherers are a distinctive object in themselves. There's something different about hunter-gatherers. The second suggests that hunter-gatherer archaeology is carried out in the same way across the world. The third, that hunter-gatherer archaeology has distinctive material remains that it deals with that other types of archaeology don't. And finally, that hunter-gatherer archaeology focuses on distinctive questions that other types of archaeology don't. I'm going to go through these in, in turn. Just to, just to note um, at this stage, what I'm talking about here is not archaeology as practiced by hunter-gatherers, but the archaeology of hunting and gathering groups. And I'll talk a little bit about indigenous archaeology later on. I'm also talking and have chosen to limit my discussion to the archaeology of Homo sapiens populations. I'll make a couple of brief references to pre-sapiens populations, but I, I don't have the expertise to be able to talk um, confidently about pre-sapiens populations. Th this is also a, this is a, a verbal presentation of a longer written paper, so I, I'm running parts of this discussion slightly light on examples, and I'd be happy to pick up upon that in the discussion um, later on. And I've, I've tried to review case studies from um, across the globe, but due to my own um, linguistic limitations, this is very much a, an anglophone bias. I'm very grateful to, to colleagues in a number of places around the world who responded to a, 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 an almost willfully naive email query from me saying, can you recommend some reading lists showing the key issues, uh, the, the key themes of the archaeology that, that's going on in your part of the world? Um, I'm very grateful to Ian McNiven and Martin Thor for really useful suggestions um, from the Australian material, and I hope that I've managed to do justice to, to that reading. Before I go on to, to look in a little bit more detail at those prisms I mentioned, I just want to, to highlight what's going to, I think, be a key distinction running through the discussion that, that, that follows. And that is that there is, I think, a, an absolutely fundamental difference between those practicing the archaeology of hunter-gatherers in, in colonized nations um, particularly where those processes of settler colonization displaced hunting and gathering communities, and there are descendant communities still resident in those areas, and those that, broadly speaking, are, are colonized nations. Um, and, and I realize there's lots of complexity in these terms. I'm using them in a, in a very simplistic way. I, Ireland, for example, clearly was a, a, a colonized country. It's often described as being the only post-colonial country in Europe. But in terms of the, the hunter-gatherer populations, they, they were long gone by the time those processes of colonization, colonization took place. So they're a very simplistic and, and simply labeled distinction in terms of this. Uh, um, for much of um, European archaeology and European um, deep time prehistory, I, I think this is a field that has been very slow to decolonize. Some of the impetus to decolonize has, has not been there. There have been really important contributions highlighting the need for this. So, um, Martin and Jackman's book on interrogating human origins um, is really important here, but we're still moving into this space. And myself and um, colleague Ben Elliott from the University of Newcastle are running a, a workshop in a month's time on decolonizing the Mesolithic, really trying to reach out to Mesolithic practitioners to see you know, if they feel there is a need to explore this agenda, what the issues involved might be, and how we move this forward. But this is this is a the the, the whole decolonizing movement has not had the impact that we might have expected it would. And, and, and within this, and I've, I've taken from my reading of, of this material, 
the, the, the need within the decolonizing practices and in terms of practicing archaeology with indigenous and descendant communities, the significance of providing ethical space in terms of the construction of knowledge, providing ethical space to bring practitioners together, and as Ian McNiven has it, within that space to, to identify and expunge any colonial underpinnings of the thought that we use. And that, that runs behind some of the arguments I want to develop as well. Okay, so returning to our, our prism themselves, the, the first prism here would be to suggest that there's unity in hunter-gatherer archaeology because there's unity in the concept of hunter-gatherers itself. And the, I think the first point to make here is, of course, that, that we recognize the idea of hunter-gatherers is a, is a distinctively problematic concept. It derives from a, a particular context, especially that of uh, 18th century Scottish Enlightenment thought. Now that drew on much more long-standing um, ideas about the relationship between subsistence and different types of societies, but it was took a particular form in the thought of the Scottish Enlightenment and played a, a fundamental role in the development of social evolutionary models, which themselves were part of a suite of ideas which enabled colonial atrocities from land grabs through to genocide. And, and hunter-gatherers, that idea of hunter-gatherers is, is implicated within this. Um, and, and that's highlighted by um, uh, Ian McNiven and Lynette Russell in the, in the, in the comments at the bottom here, where in a, in a much more post-colonial context, they ask why these types of really problematic categories remain important in our practice today. Tim Ingold argues that this idea about hunter-gatherers has a really very significant role in the structures of modern thought. It has a very special role in how we understand our place in the world. And, and that continues to be true today. I've hinted at that with the, the images from my, my childhood and what I was taught there. And I want to come right back to that at the end. But the, as I think will be widely recognized, this, this label hunter-gatherers is, is very problematic. And I think in a particularly in a European context, I, I, I can't speak to the Australian context, and I'll be interested to hear what people think. I think whilst researchers may be aware of this, and they may play some lip service to this, they don't really think through the consequences, and they haven't really problematized this aspect of the term. The term hunter-gatherer, even if it is problematic, might still be argued to be useful if it allows us to better understand patterns of similarity and difference between different groups, but, it, but it's long recognized that it doesn't. And, and two examples here, one that would be very familiar um, to you, and this is thinking perhaps about the intensification debate of the 1980s, and the long-standing recognition that the labels that were applied as horticultural communities in Papua New Guinea and hunter-gatherers in Australia mask very similar historical processes in those areas, and that those labels themselves determined quite different approaches to those societies. Or we can think about the difficulties of using these labels of hunter-gatherer and farmer during the transition, tr the transition to agriculture, as Bill Finlayson, amongst many, many others, um, have argued. And really here, the, these boundary definitions between hunter-gatherers and farmers, have, they've shifted and moved over time. They're very difficult to maintain. And in some ways, we can, we can see that we begin to introduce analytical modifiers to help police those boundaries. So we talk about low-level food production. We talk about complex hunter bringing in more ways of still trying to retain aspects of these very uh, strong categories, but clearly highlighting the, the problems they have in highlighting similarity and difference. It's also widely recognized, of course, that even the label itself, uh, hunter-gatherer, um, contains enormous diversity, even within the, the present or the ethnographically observed present, and with the expectation we should see much more diversity um, archaeologically within the deep time past. And again, this becomes manifest in different forms of subdivision, immediate return societies, delayed return societies, for example. Now, the, the way in which anthropologists have defined hunting and gathering societies changes over time. And Nuremberg David's paper that's referenced here on the slide is really useful for, for highlighting this. A, a shift and a movement from definitions that initially focused on subsistence through forms of social organization and then into different ways of understanding the, the world and other peoples within that world overall. And I think archaeological definitions tend to be less well developed than the anthropological definitions. In, in many instances, the archaeological definitions tend to start with subsistence, we'll come back to this later, and the other attributes are considered to follow this, either implicitly assumed or through different forms of, of analogy and stereotyping. And what we often end up with is perhaps quite a highly normative of hunting and gathering societies 
in the deep time part through the importation of what's often a, a model derived from the general foraging model and man hunt. Nurit but David argues that the, in terms of the diversity of hunting and gathering communities at present, what we can best think of is a series of partially shared features. And I want to come back to that idea that you create a definition by partially shared features. That hunting and gathering groups can be characterized by their subsistence strategies, the hunting and gathering, their band society, the social institution of sharing, and then a variety of ideas about their relationship with the environment and others and overall. And what's really interesting here is actually as you work through these, these definitions, these are not all straightforward to operationalize archaeologically. You, you can do some of them, and I think you can possibly even do most of them, but some of these are, are difficult for archaeologists to deal with. And I think it's worth just raising the question, however, whether anthropological and archaeological definitions of hunter gatherers are actually the same. And if they're not the same, what the consequences of that are for our practice. So the idea that there's unity in, the, in this object matter of hunter gatherers, that hunter gatherers themselves provide unity for our discipline, doesn't, doesn't seem to, to hold. And again, this, is, this has long been recognized. So an archaeological perspective from, from Bob Kelly, a self plain dirt archaeologist who has written one of the most influential summaries of hunter-gatherer ethnography for, for an archaeological audience suggests there's nothing wrong with using this term hunter-gatherer as long as we recognize it doesn't explain anything. It's only something that's there as a heuristic and a teaching device. So our, our first prism suggests that there's no, not, not unity in this for our practice. Okay, so is, is hunting and gathering archaeology the same in, in different places. So I want, what I want to do here is look at the, the relationship of archaeology to different disciplines that speak to the deep time hunter-gatherer past. I'll say something more about the particular forms of the, the hunting and gathering archaeological record in just a moment. But this is of what I want to suggest is a, a very simple model to think about the relationship between different about the political, social, or economic context of archaeology um, in, in different regions. Um, so it's just focusing on that, on that evidence itself. And again, this is, this is an area where in the written paper I have much more detail in terms of example. And I think to an extent what I'm about to say is self-evident, but there's also value in making it explicit. So I'm highlighting here what I think are perhaps five of the main direct sources of evidence we might use for understanding the deep time hunter-gatherer past. And, and in all of these um, Hello everybody. I think we've lost Warren, so I'm going to find him again. Oh, he's back. Are you still muted? Yes. Sorry, sorry about that. When did you lose me? Um, the slide with all the different conceptual circles. OK, I, I, I will try again. Apologies. Can, can you see that? Uh, maybe I need again. No, sorry, we can't sorry. see yet. Sorry, it's me. I need to go back to screen sharing. Yes, yes. And Oops. yeah, find the right place. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's all the online digital word thing. Are we uh, are we good now? Yes, we're all good. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Sorry about that. So um, yeah, I think there are probably five primary sources of direct evidence we use to reconstruct the lives of deep time hunter gatherers in different areas. And, and I think what's really important here is that the archaeology is improved as a practice through that relationship with with other disciplines. So just very much in very much in brief um, here, the archaeology is clearly associated with the study of past material culture. And nice little picture here is some polished slate um, uh, slate artifacts I've been working on at the moment from late Mesolithic um, Ireland. And as I say, I'll say something about that in in just a moment. In many areas, we also use genetic evidence, both ancient genetic material and contemporary population genetics, in order to make statements about the hunter gatherer past. That relationship between genetics and archaeology has been uh, 
particularly in a European context, problematic at times, um, and people are beginning to um, find ways of making links, uh, to make more coherent links between the different claims of the different disciplines. Um, it, the, the image there in the bottom right is a reconstruction drawing of genetic diversity in northern Scandinavia in the early Holocene period. And what's really interesting here has been the ways in which archaeologists have, have come back to the claims made by geneticists and offered a much more fine-grained, high-resolution account of the movement of people and ideas than the geneticists have been able to. It's not, it's not different than the genetic model. It's just showing how we can bring those things together to get a, a more detailed understanding. In many areas, we also have the presence of historical linguistic data, the structures of language, linguistic borrowings, and stuff like that, to understand the deep time past. And the, the tiny little diagram you can't see at all down at the bottom there is from Nicholas Burenholtz's work on Southeast Asia, where he brings together archaeological, genetic, and linguistic data to argue for the, the long term persistence of a foraging niche, which is associated with particular types of languages, but not necessarily particular ethnic groups or, or populations. But again, the, the value of that work being is bringing together a different perspective. In many areas, we have the presence of ethno-historical sources for the deep time hunter-gatherer past, so the accounts of explorers, traders, missionaries, perhaps early anthropologists as well. The um, image here is from um, uh, early Russian exploration in the um, Kodiak Islands of the Northern Pacific. Um, and this type of ethno-historic source is what Ben Fitzhugh uses as part of his narrative for understanding the evolution and development of complexity. Now, there's clearly lots of problems with using ethno-historical sources to understand the past. We have to be very concerned about turning the past into the, into the mirror of the present. And we have to understand how those processes of contact transform societies, and, and hence the, the nature of the sources that we have. But it's clear that working with ethno-historical sources is very different from working in contexts where they're not present. I remember a conversation with Colin Greer, Colin who works on the Pacific and West Coast material. He and I were talking after a conference session where he presented and I presented on the Mesolithic Europe. And, and Colin just asked me, where do you get your analogies from? Because we don't have that possibility of direct historical continuity and we don't have those ethno-historical sources. And finally, in a number of places, we have indigenous or, or tradition providing very strong evidence for um, how people's lives were organized in in the deep time past. I'll talk about this a little bit more in just a moment. Just one example here that will be very familiar to you and that's Patrick Nunn and colleagues um, work on long-term preservation of understanding of sea level change and landscape loss. Um, the, I, I think one of the one of the most significant changes in recent years in archaeological practice has been an increasing recognition of the, the potential and the value of these types of sources of evidence. So I think that, that that's probably self-evident, that, that breakdown. And as I say, that it's those interactions that are of interest to me. But what perhaps is more interesting is then when you think about how this works in different parts of the world. So for example, I think arguably in Australia, and uh, the, these are shaded in the same colors, but it's not to imply they all have exactly the same weighting. But arguably, I think in Australia, the reconstruction of the deep time past of hunter gatherers integrates all of these sources of evidence to, to greater or lesser extent. In Siberia, in contrast, material culture is important, genetics, linguistics, and ethno-historical sources, but to my understanding, much less use of indigenous oral tradition, and there's certainly much less indigenous archaeology. In Europe, by contrast, particularly Western Europe, we have material culture and we have genetics, but we have virtually no linguistic evidence, but uh, absolutely no ethno-historical sources or indigenous tradition. We, we might, if you like, on, on the one hand, think of hunter-gatherer archaeology in Europe as a, as a pure form of hunter-gatherer archaeology, but I think it's better to, to phrase that as being a very impoverished form of hunter-gatherer archaeology. And just by point of comparison, again, if we were to think about free sapiens populations, again, you're only thinking about material culture and genetics. So coming back to my, my original comment, uh, is hunter-gatherer archaeology the same in different places? That, that very simple model suggests that it can't be. It can't be at all. So the third of my prisms was thinking is archaeology or culture and particularly stone tools. And, and here I must hold my hands up to, to a stereotype. 
Um, I, I'm a specialist in stone tools and landscapes. I work on hypermicrolithic sites in the uplands of Scotland at the moment. So I, I recognize lots of aspects of this stereotype. But I, I don't think it holds as a definition of what we do. So again, another one of these, these overlapping diagrams. Highlighting themes, you often see stress in the literature that it's supposed to characterize hunter-gatherer archaeology. First of these is that hunter-gatherer archaeology is very old. It's older than other kinds of archaeology. And well, yes, even just restricting, restricting to Homo sapiens, hunter-gatherer archaeology can be very old. If we're thinking about human dispersals or colonizations, we're dealing with time spans of tens of thousands of years. But of course, in some places, agricultural communities can be very old. In Southwest Asia, for example, you're probably talking about agriculture from 10,000 or 9,000 years ago, and much of the hunter-gatherer archaeology people deal with around the world is much younger than that. So it's not, it's not sufficient just to say that hunter-gatherer archaeology is, is old. Perhaps it's more interesting to, to think about that hunter-gatherer archaeology is often the oldest archaeology in any particular region. And I think this is really important in terms of its relationships to, to, to phonemy and preservation, but also possibly to discussions of origins as well. So not old, but maybe the oldest. Hunter-gatherer archaeology is also often considered to be highly taphonomically altered, and this is obviously related to these issues about age. This operates at site level as well as levels of the, the landscape, and we have, I think, uh, and it should be a, a source of pride to us as a, as a discipline, we have a significant history of integration with geoarchaeology and paleolandscape reconstructions. We are, I think, good at recognizing, the, increasingly good at recognizing the time averaged character of the evidence that we deal with and adjusting our analytical approaches appropriately. Now, these issues aren't exclusive to hunter-gatherer archaeology, but they're particularly well developed there. And arguably, I would say, in the archaeology of agricultural communities in Europe, these, these issues are significantly underdeveloped. Final two points I want to make uh, both relate to the same overarching um, comment, and I realize I have a, a spelling mistake in this um, now, which is many people claim that hunter-gatherer archaeology is distinctive because hunter-gatherers have a relatively limited range of material culture, and that this limited range of material culture might be related to the mobility of these communities or a lack of hierarchy within these communities. Um, and again, both of these break down when we, when we look at them in terms of a distinctive definition. In terms of hierarchy, we don't have to get too involved into conversations about whether or not the early um, human groups were characterized by egalitarian or not, to recognize that there's sufficient diversity in the social organization of hunter-gatherers, many of which are, are not egalitarian um, at all. Or in terms of thinking about mobility, yes, many hunter-gatherers are mobile, but not all of them are, and all societies are mobile in, in different ways and in different extents. And we might, for example, make comparisons between the archaeology of hunter-gatherers and the archaeology of pastoral communities. So again, these aren't, these aren't exclusive definitions. And even that idea of a limited range of material culture simply breaks down in many contexts. These are just a couple of screen grabs from the, the wonderful excavations carried out by the University of, of Aberdeen at Nunalek, a Yupik Inuit um, settlement eroding out of permafrost um, in the far north with a fantastic array of material culture. So again, I don't think that the nature of our material provides you. Perhaps some of this comes from the, the types of questions or the approaches that we deal with. Now, uh, some of the themes that people sometimes talk about as characterizing hunter-gatherer archaeology are important. Anna Prentice, for example, says that hunter-gatherer archaeology is much more interested nowadays in landscapes and, and gender. And I think that's true, but that's clearly not distinct to hunter-gatherer archaeology. That's a broader sweep of changes in terms of, in terms of archaeological practice. Again, I think there are, there are some themes which seem perhaps more distinctive. I just want to run through these. So the first is you'll see a common refrain that suggests that hunter-gatherer archaeology faces particular challenges in understanding social aspects of the past. And this is really tied in, going back to the, uh, to the ladder of inference and a whole series of old ideas which suggest that we're on much more solid ground reconstructing subsistence and anything beyond that is quite problematic. And, and what's actually happening with a number of those accounts is that they'll, they'll seek to interpret subsistence and then a lot of the social stuff comes in through normative analogies at various degrees of explicit or implicit um, argument. But I think here, coming back to that idea about the, the ethical space for, for our research and trying to understand the past in terms of, of human lives, I think it's absolutely essential that we seek to understand the social world 
challenges of the past. And I'm, I'm concerned that this refrain that we have so many methodological challenges around this, th that that pessimism downplays the creativity of so many wonderful and different approaches to understanding the social worlds of the past. So I, I, I don't think that methodological challenge is an appropriate way of trying to define what we do, because I, I think fundamentally that's a very pessimistic definition. Hunter gatherer archaeology is also obviously strongly influenced by evolutionary perspectives, particularly what we might broadly talk about as the, as the field of human behavioral ecology. That's particularly characteristic of hunter gatherer archaeology. It's also there in terms of discussions of the origins of agriculture, but much less frequent in periods, in periods following that. And I think probably most hunter gatherer archaeology practitioners have some awareness of, some familiarity with the approaches of, of HPE. These are obviously very, very, um, th th there's been a lot of criticism of HPE on a variety of different grounds, but in terms of the, the discussion today, and again, thinking about that ethical space for how we understand the, the human past overall, I think it's really important to understand that the, the criticisms of HPE, which have been um, strongly opposed to the idea of imposing a, a rational economic actor into the deep time past, into, into what some have suggested is almost a, an act of colonization of the deep time past again. Hunter gatherer archaeology is also clearly interested in the origins of key traits. So, hunter gatherer archaeology looks at things like the adoption of agriculture, the origins of inequality, where gender divisions may lie in different ways. And, th and this is an important part of what we do. But it's not the it's not the only archaeological discipline that looks at the origins of, of key things. The archaeology of the medieval period, for example, is sometimes very bound up with questions around the origins of capitalism. So we're not the only archaeology that's looking, that's looking at origins. And what may be of interest here, and this comes back to that, that powerful idea of hunter gatherers, is that the origins we deal with are often seen to be in some ways fundamental to who we are as people, to who we are as a society. And finally, in terms of these distinctive questions and approaches, and this is something that's come to me as, I, as I've worked through this, this, this paper, is that many hunting and gathering, many practitioners of hunter gatherer archaeology are increasingly aware of the need for decolonization of our practices. And this is where we might think, for example, about the, the rise of indigenous archaeology and how our practice relates to, to, colonial, to colonial legacy. And the the, I, I feel very strange talking about indigenous archaeology to an Australian audience, um, but the indigenous archaeology um, at, its, at its best is clearly a, a bringing together of different epistemological frameworks, different understandings, and that those collaborations and that openness to different perspectives can be, can be very beneficial in unsettling and challenging the ways that people think and work and lead to very, very positive outcomes. And the, one of the examples I used in the, in the paper, um, a, a recently published example by Bruno Davis and colleagues, their reworking of the excavations at Clogs Cave, informed by and working in collaboration with local communities and their understanding of the sorts of activities that might have taken place in caves, and then thinking about the material traces of this. And I think this is, this is fantastic and really important work. And I, I think important also not to be too complacent um, about that. Some of you may have seen the, the um, social media discussion and online discussion about the problems of the SAA at the moment with papers being uh, very, very critical of NAG NAGPRA and um, very critical of indigenous belief systems in relation to this. So we, we shouldn't be complacent about the achievements of indigenous archaeology. In, in, a, in a European context, the, these issues are, are obviously rather different in the colonial legacy. Um, are rather different. And, and I've actually become increasingly concerned by the way that um, European archaeology uses indigenous worldviews for a series of analogies, again, dressed up in a, in a variety of different levels of, of formality, but uh, an importation, a bringing in of distinctive indigenous worldviews from different places into the deep time past of, of Europe, and with a, with a resulting often a, a creation of a, a a unified hunter-gatherer way of being that might be characterized by being animist, for example, or a hunter-gatherer um, uh, particular understandings of cosmology. But this is imported into the deep time past, and that, that unified view, that flattening of indigenous worldviews is often taking place without a careful consideration of the, of the ethics of bringing those sorts of ideas into the deep time past. And I think there's a, there's a need for reflection around that. Okay. 
So to try and tease some of these things out for consideration, the, the four prisms revisited. I, I hope to have shown you that there's no simple unity to hunter-gatherer archaeology as a, as a practice. None of these prisms through which I've tried to assess it provide us with immediate coherence for the practice. There might perhaps be some partially shared features. There might perhaps be some common ground running through all of this, but there's no simple standard universal definition of hunter-gatherer archaeology. So if that's the case, how might we justify continuing to talk about it? So we have this, this commonality, but how can we continue? Why is it of value to continue talking about this? And here this, this comes back to this idea about positionality. Where are you asking the question from? What are you trying to achieve? To, to come back to Bob Kelly's comments, we, we, what, is, what is the heuristic and pedagogical purpose that you're trying to, you're trying to achieve? So the first point, I think, is that by talking about a hunter-gatherer archaeology, we enable the creation of community. We enable the, we enable the bringing together of people with some form of common ground who might share interests and discussions and ideas, different perspectives, different approaches, but coming together to, to, to see how those help each other think about the deep time past. And perhaps the, the most obvious example um, of this in terms of communities at the moment is the International Society for, for hunter-gatherer research and their, and their CHAGS meeting. Although I, I must note this picture is from Vienna in 2015. This is their closing plenary, what have we learned? And there's four anthropologists and one archeologist on the stage, but that's, that's something we're, we're working on and, and, and trying, to, trying to improve. I think in my particular context, there's another reason for thinking that there remains value in talking about hunter-gatherer archeology. span And that is within the European context, the, continuing public power of this idea of, of hunter-gatherers um, as, as a really important way of thinking about human diversity. And um, Noah Lavi, Alice Roger, and myself recently submitted a paper arguing that in popular culture in Britain and Ireland, hunter-gatherers are presented as the antithesis and the antidote to the problems of modern society, that they're in a variety of different fields through public health, mental health, through things around forest school, through things around prepping, these are continually being presented as a way of, of solving the problems that we face in the modern world. And I think that, that public interest in the concept here is a significant opportunity for us as, as practitioners, as people researching the deep time hunting capital past. And also, I, I must acknowledge that, that I work within a neoliberal university context. Um, one of the ways in which success of our courses and programs will be assessed is by their ability to recruit students. And th 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 that's just the brute financial reality of the economic model that we work in within these fields. So in this sense, I think that there, there may potentially be some justification for continuing to use this idea of, of hunter-gatherers and hunter-gatherer archaeology as a hook to be able to bring people in to programs, as a hook to be able to bring people into to discussions, and then from that to, if you like, to, to read things a little bit against the grain. To, to show the complexities and the problems associated with some of these categories. And in this, perhaps we can, we can make some connections to the kinds of definitions of decoloniality that Bignola and Walsh talk about. It's a process, a practice, and a project of sowing seeds. And, and here's a little hunter-gatherer stroke farmer, again from me at seven or eight years old, carefully sowing seeds to try and lead some kind of revolution. In terms of the subject matter, Thomas Whitlock, in a really useful um, summary paper, offers a, offers a really um, interesting definition of, of hunter-gatherers. And within this, it, it, it's important to, to think about hunter-gatherers in terms of comparison with the way that we live today. And he suggests that what's interesting about hunter-gatherers is that, or studying hunter-gatherers, is that it enriches the spectrum of possible life ways that humans have been able to bring about. And it enriches our attempts to understand how humans create any kind of particular socio-cultural environment in the first place. And I think that this idea that, that hunter-gatherers help us think about alternatives it is absolutely critical. And in, a, in an archaeological sense, we can, we can imagine different pasts and hopefully use those to, to think about different futures. So is there such a thing as, as hunter-gatherer archaeology? Well, I think there can be, or there might be, if we're aware of the limits of this term and the, and the implications of its use. And I'm aware that a response to this question will be different from a European perspective than it might be, than it might be from others. 
And I think whilst there's no simple unity to the to the craft of, of hunter gatherer archaeology, we might be able to talk about some partially shared features that enable us to to create the communities of research, to to share ideas, to share methods, to share reflections, but perhaps to share an attitude, if you like, to to some of the things we do in our knowledge production. I think in an Anglophone European context, the, the power of hunter gatherers is such that working that concept against the grain can be justified as a position. And I think if we think about hunter-gatherer archaeology as a practice that, that seeks to understand past hunter-gatherer lives, to enrich our understanding of the spectrum of the possible, there, there's a, a useful space for that. I, I, I think to be effective, and this comes back almost to this idea about the ethical space, and perhaps that's the, perhaps that's the core of this whole discussion, hunter-gatherer archaeology must be self-critical in developing its perspective not least given the problematic history of its context. And I think it needs to be global in its outlook. We need to learn from each other. And this, this is enabled by transnational communities of research. I think it must also engage outside of the academy, using all the potentials of that, that, that public recognition of, of, of a central context. And that's a really useful book to have. And I think if those conditions are fulfilled, then in the context where, where I work, at least, th there can be such a as hunter gatherer archaeology, and I, I can continue to justify using that rather problematic term. I hope that those reflections have been of some interest. Um, I, I, I'm aware it's very much a, a think piece, and I thank you for your attention, and I very much look forward to the chance to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. I'm going to uh, let everybody come back. Excellent. Do you want me to stop? Um, Do you want me to stop screen sharing at that point? Uh, yes, you could. So maybe we can actually put the share the images for most people here. Um, so if, for the people online, please, can I ask you if you want to ask a question to first uh, send a message in the chat. Um, so I can see who is going to ask a question and at the same time I can try to um, check who in the room wants to ask a question. So is there anyone in real life who would like to ask a question here before we go to the digital people? Martin? Because <laughs> Martin is writing, yeah, we can see you, you're writing done things. <laughs> I thought, hello, uh, Graham, can you hear me? I can hear you. Nice to see you, okay. Martin. Oh, you can see me as well. Okay. I, this just is just to be, you're very, very small. <laughs> very small. Um, yeah, th thanks for that. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, I didn't think that I should say something immediately because maybe somebody else, because we maybe have more opportunities to chat about that. But, but just one actually question for you um, is because you talked about... Um, that there is a growing interest in, in Europe or in general in hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and in this, and, and I actually um, was interested in, you know, how you think, how can one can responsibly take advantage of that? Because, of course, that when you say, of course, we need to attract students uh, in, in that respect, because, of course, my, my impression is that the current interest in hunter gatherers is, of course, very much driven by the fact that they are over romanticized uh, as you know in this kind of like original condition of humanity where everything was sustainable and equality and actually is a mirror image of all the problems that we are facing globally at the moment so my question is and maybe it's a tough one how can we actually responsibly take advantage of that uh, of that interest and actually then at the, at the same time possibly even transforming our own uh, field by reflecting on these issues that I think actually we have not been reflecting that much uh, in our field, you know, in, 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 in a very deep uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Martin. It's a really good question and a really, and a really difficult um, question, hugely, hugely important. Um, so the, the, the work we did looking at public perceptions of hunter-gatherers was, was very much focused on, on Britain and Ireland, and that's where, that's where we put our limits. And we, we recognized at the time that it would be really interesting to do a, a similar kind of analysis in, in places like America or Australia, where there are issues around descendant communities and, and some of these things probably play out very differently. And um, perhaps, perhaps naively, 
I, I would hope that because the, these ideas, and they are terrible stereotypes, are, are very prevalent in, in public debate, that, that gives us an opportunity to engage by, by using the appropriate platforms to, to challenge aspects of those, of those stereotypes. Um, and in terms of potentially recruiting students, I think that's the, the same thing again, to, to bring people in because they think they, they're interested in, in a particular concept and then try and highlight the different levels of, of complexity that, that are within that. But I think it's, a, I think it's increasingly um, a, a situation where I don't think, sorry, too many, too many negatives in my sentence. I don't think we have any option but to try and engage with those stereotypes. We could, we could carry on and keep on just doing our, our thing and work quietly away in academia. But I don't think that's I don't think that's appropriate. I think trying to find some ways of challenging and opening out conversations about the hunter gatherer past, about the diversity of hunter gatherers, and about the, the problems of those stereotypes, I think is really really critical. So I haven't I haven't formally I haven't properly formulated how to do that yet. But I know that it, it's something that is is absolutely critical. Does that does that begin to answer that question? Thank you. I can see in the Thank chat you. that there are several comments from Steve Brown, Lynette Russell, and Ian McNiven about this question around the de actual definition of hunter-gatherer uh, as maybe being the basis for um, the question, the problem of is there an archaeology of hunter-gatherer? Because are there actually hunter-gatherer in the first place? Uh, uh, absolutely. Do you, do you want me to answer that in, in, in those terms? Yes, um, maybe if some of these people would like to say a word about it, I'll just wait a little bit if yep. you want to unmute yourself, but otherwise, um, I guess they all point to the same kind of question. I suppose I could say something. Hello, Graham. How are you going? Hi, Ian. How's things? Very good. Thank you. A wonderful talk, yeah. It's, it's one of those talks where, yeah, in a sense, the question is actually much more important than the answer. But, um, but yeah, if we want to bring what Steve is saying, what Lynette's saying, what I'm saying there, I mean, yeah, does it actually, does it come back to the whole question of, like, what is a hunter-gatherer? And if we come back, go back to the original sort of formulation of hunter-gatherers as started by the Greeks, Romans, like you pointed out there, um, that Lynette and I were talking about, but also coming into the, uh, where it's the, you know, the English Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment, et cetera, where these ideas really start taking sort of a, a more solid shape. Um, I mean, it, it really is a case of hunter-gatherers are defined more in terms of what they don't have. So these are, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative. So, um, you know, these are societies that don't have, in particular, sort of horticulture or agriculture. And even the, and even the Enlightenment sort of philosophers were, were really playing around with the idea of, like, how do you come up with a hierarchy of humanity um, and if you actually come up with, say, uh, and they're actually, they're, they're quite explicit about this. If you wanted to use the religious concepts, um, it doesn't work because it doesn't put Europeans at the top. In fact, it may have put Aboriginal people at the top. We can't have that. Um, if you want to use sort of different, even sort of certain types of technology, et cetera, it, it doesn't work. The only way that they could sort of, in a sense, rank people successfully um, is, is the foundation of social evolutionism was to, to bring back this whole idea that let's go back to basic subsistence strategies. So, um, and, and that's where we get the idea of hunter-gatherers kept being sort of formulated. So if we sort of bring all that together here, yeah, it, it, it becomes deeply sort of problematic and for the exact sort of reasons that, that you're looking into now, um, I guess we're not gonna solve this tonight, are we? Because I mean, you're putting down the entire edifice of uh, anthropology and and, and much sort of archaeology around the world, and you know, far be it to solve that tonight. But um, but I, I guess it is it is it does come back to that issue, doesn't it? Definition. Yeah, absolutely, it does, Ian. And, and, and thanks very much for the for the comment. I I, I agree with you. I think it, the, the question on this is more important than the answer. And my my only hope is that by unpacking that question a little bit, I I, I perhaps give people some things to to think about. The I, I think it's Steve's comment in the in the chat as well, saying that in a, in an Australian context, he really wouldn't use the, the term hunter gatherer. That's that's exactly the feedback I had from American colleagues um, as well. So I'd, I'd highlight again that my response is a is a European one. It, it's not something I'd, I'd wish to, to seek to impose in in other contexts. Uh, 
that, that's not that's not what I'm trying to do with all of this. And I, I think you're right that the, the, these issues are about the, the problems with the definitions of the term itself. We recognise it's had a deeply problematic history as well as being flawed as a as an analytical term. I, I suppose in a and I've I've my mind has, has kind of wobbled on this as I've gone through the, the kind of journey of this paper locked away in my bedroom for the last 12 months because we can't go anywhere else at the, at the moment. Um, but I think, in a, again, in, a, in an Anglophone European context, I think the, the power of that concept is, it, the resonance of that concept is such that I've got more chance of being able to, um, to, to change people's minds about it by using it as a hook than by just trying not to not to use it. I think there's a potential in in still retaining that phrase at the moment because of the the impact it has as an idea that you can then begin to take apart and begin to show all of those problematic problematic ideas. But that is that's a a, a very British Irish European response to that. I think if I was working in a different different environment, I, I may well have a very different take on foregrounding that term. But yeah, the, the, those bigger issues about these definitions, we, we could and we should be discussing for a, a very long time. Um, I, I also think, and it's, you know, the, the, the term hunter-gatherer is embedded in all of the, all of the Ishka materials, the Chags materials, and that's the only global, global framework we have for coming together to talk specifically about hunting and gathering groups. And, and that's an organization that, that I think generally does good things, and that by bringing people together, those are very useful things. So that there's a need to think how we balance those sorts of things as well and how we maintain those types of communities. Thank you. Um, I can see there are also uh, questions from Joe Dorch um, in relation to this issue that the idea is maybe around the fact that it's this external position, um, maybe as non-hunter-gatherer, um, trying to study what we define as hunter-gatherer societies, um, which also relates to, I guess, the comments that was made uh, by John um, on the fact that people who live in this way that we call hunter-gatherer don't obviously um, see it uh, this way. They see it as the normal way of living. Um, so again, I will leave a bit of time for either Joe um, or John to uh, say a word if they want, um, or otherwise you can just um, say something about it if you want. Joe, do you want to say something? Okay, maybe not. What I was interested in, and thanks, Graham, for a fascinating presentation. I was quite taken with your depiction of sources of information about hunter-gatherers being different in different places. And as you pointed out, here in Australia, we have kind of the full palette, if you like to use the term, different sources of information. I think that's something that's very enriching. But as, as I said in my comment, people don't, the people in the desert that I worked with and I was a young fella, they were kind of, as I said, they were, the, they were the same age as me when they first encountered the external world. So in that sense, they were still, 23 years later, still living the dream, as they would say. Um, but the interesting thing as a social anthropologist, and I know that this is an archaeology discussion, but it does have significance, is how do we balance the views of the past with the views in the present about the past from Indigenous people, and also their assertion of how do they articulate their continuing engagement with language, with country, uh, with the environment. The bushfire crisis here has propelled an interest in Aboriginal, more broadly in Australia, Aboriginal uh, bushfire control techniques, just as an example. Um, how do we balance these kind of new forms of information of people using having something like the Toyota dreaming, which is a new dreaming, but it exists in the desert. Uh, it's associated with uh, pearl shells that have been bored out to obtain, you know, these implanted half pearl things. They are the headlights of the Toyota in the dreaming. I can talk about this. It's open. It's an open thing. But what interests me is how do we balance these views, the contemporary views of current existence, 
with the views of uh, archaeologists who are working way back in, with, with materials that date way back in the past? I guess that's my question. It's a very good question, John, and it's one that I, I feel singularly unsuited to, to answer um, in, in current context, in, in that this is, I, I work in a, in a situation where these, these issues are not live in the same kind of, in the same kind of way. I, I, I don't have the, the first-hand experience of those types of negotiations. Um, I, my, my understanding, and it, you know, hopefully in part in the example I offered in, in the talk, that the that by creating the, the appropriate ethical spaces to to bring different communities together, to bring researchers and different stakeholders together, there's the potential to create common ground to to work through those issues and to bring those different perspectives together. And, and my understanding is that some of the some of the most successful forms of, of indigenous archaeology resulted in those kinds of unsettlings and, and challenges to, to dominant viewpoints, but. But there are there are many people in the audience here who are, who are much more experienced at actually working through that on the ground than, than I than I would be, and I I, I I wouldn't dream of telling people how to how to resolve those problems. I just I just don't have the first hand experience. It would be be it there'd be context I'd be fascinated to be involved in to, to try and see how those uh, how those discussions play out. But it's it's just not something I've, I've had to be in, given the, the nature of my particular research history. Yeah. So sorry, that's a that's a dodging of the question, but I <laughs> but I think it's the only answer I can give. It's legitimate. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Graham. Cheers, John. Thank you. We've got another question. Yes, there's the question by Helen. And then Sven, is it related to that at all? Or Okay, we'll just, um, so there was an interesting question uh, by Helen about, you know, this, around this definition of hunter-gatherer. Um, and I think that's related to this idea that hunter-gatherer are mainly defined on the basis that it's on the lack of agriculture, which is obviously a very Eurocentric way of um, describing and defining hunter-gatherer. And on this point, I was interested to see on the website of the International Society for Hunter-Gatherer Research, there's no actual definition of what a hunter-gatherer is supposed to be. So that's probably related if you want to say something more about that. Um, and then I'll go to Sven for the question. Yeah, um, thank you. so I suppose the, the, the website for me does an overhaul um, anyway, but the um, the International Society hasn't, I, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't tried to provide a, a single modern definition of, of what a hunter-gatherer is. We, I, I spent a period of time as editor of their, a co-editor of their journal, Hunter-Gatherer Research, and actually we spent considerable time in that discussion thinking about, you know, we, what, what examples can we include, what falls within that, that limit of, of hunter-gatherers. So there is no there's no formal definition in, in that sense from Ishka. Ishka has tended to be very inclusive um, in its in its approaches. Um, so no, there's, there's no simple definition um, presented there. And, and I think it would probably be inappropriate for it to for it to do so. May I ask, make a comment? Hi, Lynette. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Graham, and you. That was fabulous, absolutely fantastic, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And particularly you, because you took me to my first true love, and that is Marx. <laughs> and I think when it's all said and done, we all need to go back and have a damn good read and think again about what we're talking about when we're talking about economy or, or any of those kind of concepts that we take as a given, what you've done is really reminded us that it's much, much more complex. In fact, Steve Brown had a lovely comment in there. Um, I've lost it now. It was in the, um, in the chat. But I think it's really time that we do rethink these categories because they're not useful. I mean, th th they have a certain, you know, a certain cachet, but they're not useful in what we're trying to do now. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Lynette, thank you. And uh, the, I was actually, I saw the comments in there and was gonna ask you what, what specifically you were talking about in terms of, in 
significance of marks and how that was going to work. And so whilst I've read my marks, I'll have to go back and do it and do my homework on on those things. But yeah, I think it's with with all of these things, it's a it's what we're trying to do with the with the category with the labels that we're that we're utilizing. And yep. I think shine shining a, a slightly more critical light on some of the habitual ones is is really very very helpful and yeah and i think that, yeah it, work that yourself and ian have done has, has really shown some of these issues for, for this terminology and um, i think again in a in a european context there's much less awareness of that the, the, that understanding of the of the, the post-colonial context of so much of our work just hasn't hasn't come through and there's a very habitual use of these things in the academy and beyond mm -hmm. the, the academy as well. And as I say, I, at the moment, I'm, I'm arguing that it would be difficult to lose that term, and we're therefore better trying to, to be critical of it. But it, it all does depend on the questions you're asking, and, and yeah. the, types, yeah. the types of things you're trying to do. Hi, Graham Sven Usman here from UWA. I've just got two quick comments um, which draw on all of those. So, you know, one is the, the, the four sort of lenses that you present. I mean, those are useful, but in the, I'd ask, I'd, I'd sort of put it to you that if you did the same for farming societies, you'd probably come up with the same conclusion as well, that yep. there's nothing particularly distinctive about farming archaeology, for example. So um, drawing on, on Lynette and Steve and Ian's sort of comments is, in addition to Mark's sort of standpoint, feminism is quite useful in asking, well, who made these definitions and why are they making them? They they're quite old now and they can be revisited. And maybe what we're really looking at are sort of people land relationships that fluctuate. So going back, you know, now 40 years to sort of Chase and Hines's work on domiculture showing, well, you know, hunter gatherers are perfectly familiar with the reproductive cycles of animals and plants and such like. And they, but they, they have a much more subtle way, a change of intensity, if you like, rather than a change of mode in dealing with quite severe climatic, social and other changes. And so it might be useful if, if hunter gatherer, this term is going to have any use. I think we could either do things like um, we, we could do things like deploy it in unfamiliar ways. So for example, it's not just stuff that is very old. Um, in African context, you find many far what are called farming societies whose middens clearly show most of their subsistence is hunted and gathered, but they're not called hunter gatherers, they're called farmers because of the, the teleology you mentioned um, in Ian McNiven's work, for example. And, and you know, for example, um, Dee's question about what do the sand call themselves or what do hunter gatherers call themselves? Well, I mean, sand people like the co most of those words mean people or they have a prefix or suffix kova, the real people. Interestingly, other hunter-gatherers who they don't know are not real people. So um, real people could be non-hunter-gatherers, they could be hunter-gatherers. So I'd sort of reiterate that we shouldn't look, we, we should abandon the term and look instead at these intensities and types of people-land relationships. As, as a rock art specialist, I would chuck in there that, that rock art is a particularly agentive and well-informed artifact that gives insight to these. I appreciate the Highlands of Scotland might not have a whole lot of rock art in it. Um, but, you know, hunter-gatherer is too off, you know, rock art is hived off again into a separate field of study once again and divorced from the hunter-gatherer, which is often then this material. But, but thank you very much. Yeah, and, and essentially I'll just sort of wrap up my thoughts by saying that the term is no longer useful and we, we need to challenge ourselves to be more creative in using something else. Um, thank, thank you very much for the comment. You, to, to very large, it might sound um, it sounds strange given I ended up saying I thought we could justify continuing to use the term, but, but I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, it's it, it is such a such a problematic term um, overall, and thinking about all of those different really interesting and exciting ideas you mentioned there in terms of thinking about the relationship between people and the land is it, it, hugely important, and doing and doing that and highlighting. The, those ranges of understandings is, is really significant. I think the, the, the rock art point is, is really important. It's, it's both Ian and Martin passed on a, a, a really interesting example of, of rock art case studies to me, some of which I was familiar with. But the I think those offer some really wonderful examples of, of working with and through different understandings of the world and the way that, that challenges our, our, our dominant approaches to, to that material. So it's, it's something I hope to be able to explore explore much more. 
and you said the, the, the four prisms you, you could apply to any kind of, of archaeological practice. Yeah, again, I'd, I'd agree entirely. I suppose all I was doing was, was trying just to find a way of, of thinking through and breaking down categories that we, we don't often question in quite that way and, and breaking it down into, into smaller bits to help people follow a, follow a narrative. And I, I don't anticipate that this paper was, was written very much in mind that it's, it's going to be the, the the first seminar paper I give to students on the new program in September. It, it's written as a as a as a think piece. It's written to introduce people to a, a range of ideas, and it's written to try and prompt people to to develop their own um, answer to that, rather than to necessarily believe what I'm saying. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, participating in the discussion, and we are a little bit over time. So I think we've answered almost everybody um, questions and we might leave it here for now, uh, but you can keep the discussion going via email, I guess. And Emily, this is also... Could, could I just make one comment? It, it came yes. up in the discussion there, which is simply to extend an invitation to, to all of you to attend CHAGS 13 in Dublin um, next summer. Um, there'll be information going up online about this, about this very shortly, but we, we look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible to, to continue this and, and other types of interesting discussions about hunter-gatherers there. Okay, perfect. Well, now that you're tweeting um, crazily with Martin, you might be able to share this information. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, the Twittersphere. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody, um, for also supporting and surviving all the Zoom kind of uh, adventures. Uh, and we hope to see you next week, one hour earlier at 3 p.m. WHM. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the discussion. Bye. Brian, that was wonderful. Thank you. I, I, I hope I did justice to yourself and Martin's reading lists. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>